the New York City subway keeps the city moving, but it's also carrying a hidden danger. Electric bikes and scooters, they're riding these trains every day, and their batteries, they can fail without warning. Down here, a major fire hasn't happened yet, but it's only a matter of time. That's why I came back to New York, into the subway, to chat with a man who led the FDNY's lithium-ion battery task force, and talk about why these electric bikes and scooters, they need to be banned from the subway before one burst into flames, becoming a mass casualty event. You found Stashed. I'm Pat, firefighter, mechanical engineer, and battery guy. So I'm John Orlando. I retired uh, last July from the FDNY after 27 years. Last couple years, I was supervising fire marshal, uh, doing origin and cause investigations, but really concentrating on the uh, origin and cause of fires regarding lithium ion batteries here in New York City. Well, what year did you start noticing that you were having those fires and that it was a problem? Yeah, so initially we started noticing about uh, 22, I say 21, 22. We were going back to commercial fires, Hazmat was returning to these, it was rigid Kindles, uh, and we're saying what was the issue? Because we had some of our fires in some retail stores that were selling electric bikes and electric scooters. Okay. Uh, then it became a mitigation question. Then it became a, well, what's really happening with these devices? Why are they catching on fire? And it became an investigation question. But as you and I have discussed in the past, then once I started looking into this in uh, 2022 and started really deep dive with the investigations, I realized I went to a fire as far back as 2013, 2014, 2018. Sure. Which I didn't realize was a lithium ion battery fire. Uh, so right around 2022, you started really tracking the, the lithium ion battery fires really related to the micromobility. How's that? been doing for the city and what has that led to? Right, so that so what we first had to do is with our investigations is we had to create a specific cause code uh, of the lithium ion battery fires so that we could track it within our reports. And we did that in the spring, uh, the fall of 21. And then once we had the cause code, I could start looking at the fire marshal reports. But we also noticed in 22 that some of the information that we were getting asked about, like make a model, types of devices wasn't in the reports. So in 23 is really when we had our first really great year of data, because we created a checklist for fire marshals to ask specific questions. And as you know, there's a difference between an e-scooter, an e-bike, an e-moped, a hoverboard. Right. So getting uh, the marshals and the investigations to identify those differences, and then seeing if we could get make the models, really happened really well in 2023. And you've actually seen a number of fatalities. That number, thankfully, has gone down. I think this year you're only at one. So far this year, uh, a terrible incident, 4th of July. A lady walked into a pizza store, 76-year-old woman. She went to use the bathroom. There was an e-bike parked outside the bathroom. They went to thermal runaway while she was in the bathroom. She got trapped. Fire department had to rescue her. She succumbed to her injuries later, two days later. It's a terrible incident. I know there have been terrible incidents in the past. I think one year you had 16 fatalities. Yeah, so 2023, that year was 18. That was 18, okay. Yeah. And then the thing that really garnered a lot of attention when the media started paying attention was that famous roof rope rescue in 22, November of 2022. Right. And that's when the city, the media started paying attention. And when worldwide, we were getting calls from as far as London and New South Wales about what was going on here because they were seeing similar things don't happen there. There's a lot of initiative after that to start educating the public around e-bikes, e-scooters, getting regulations in. Yeah, and we had started that before, but having the media attention helped us get more information out, helped us spread the message. The city invested more money into public safety messaging, putting things in different languages, us going to the retail locations and giving them information as we were updating our fire code and updating legislation to try to not ban certified devices, but require anyone who is selling, renting, or leasing either an e-scooter or an e-bike or a battery to have them built to UL standards and have them certified that they were built to the UL standard. So I know what the problem is. I know a lot of my audience understands the problem, but explain the problem with an e-bike when it does go on a thermal runaway. All you need is that one cell. And it's uh, usually it's a cylindrical cell, cylindrical cells built. And it could be in an e-scooter, we could have anywhere from 48 cells, to an e-bike could have 68 to 72 cells, to a moped could have 130 cells, sure. individual cells. We need that one cell has to fail, goes into thermal runaway, starts to off gas, heats up, and now once it starts, uh, goes on fire, it now propagates to the remaining cells. 
So that's that continuous loop of that exothermic chemical reaction that we can't stop. Right. Uh, and then once it happens, that's why you see it starting with an off gas and then you see it just ex it looks like little, small little explosions as it propagates from cell to cell to cell. And it's, it's such an intense fire, it kicks off if it's in a structure, it's blocking your way of exit. Yep. Uh, it's sending cells elsewhere in the structure, so it's starting multiple spot fires, and it's just a real, real hazard. Right. As we've seen the videos of the cells exploding out of the, the pack and just flying, uh, and now imagine that, right, inside a structure, inside a living room, inside right. uh, an apartment. Now that's spreading to the rest of the contents of the apartment. Yeah, and now all the work that has been done here in, in New York City, the public education, my understanding the numbers have been going the number of fires haven't been going down, but the number of injuries have been going down. Yeah, the FDNY, uh, HAZMAT, uh, Bureau of Fire Investigation, Fire Prevention, all part of the Lithium Ion Task Force has done a great job in educating the public and bringing the number of fatalities down. But unfortunately, because it's so prevalent, we have so much Lithium Ion Battery Mobility Devices and other devices that we're noticing uh, that the numbers have gone up. But what's been also troubling is we've seen the number of structural fires go up. So with all education about trying to charge these outside and not put them inside, we're seeing an increase in structural fires inside, as well as an increase in fires overall. Right, and today we're, we're in the subway because this is really the, the, the hazard that is up next. It hasn't happened yet here in, in New York City, at least not that I'm aware of, at least not a big fire. Right. Um, we've seen them in Toronto, but What's your thoughts on e-bikes, micro-mobility yeah. in the subway system? Yeah, so as you know, I wrote an op-ed in February that they published in the Daily News uh, saying that we should be banning e-bikes on New York City Transit because of the dangers, because of how quickly the fires uh, propagate from cell to cell, how volatile they are, how high the energy is, but also because it's a confined space. Right. And we know the dangers and, the to and you've reported about the toxicity of the smoke. So this is a confined space and having a fire in here. Now, we're in the last car, and we talked about this earlier. Right. So you don't have two exits. If yep. this happens, like we're in the tunnel right now, we're not at a station. If it, God forbid something goes off and there's a scooter right down there, yep. right now, if it goes off, people it, only have one way out, but it's closer to the other exit. You can't get out this exit. Yeah, there's nowhere for us to go right now. In the middle of the tunnel, we'd be out of luck. Yes. And part of the issue is because when they fail, they fail so fast. The, the environment in here will become untenable very quickly, within probably 10, 15 seconds. Uh, just from your experience, if we had to stop this car in the middle of the tunnel, how long would it take for the, the car to come to a complete stop before we could open one of these doors manually? Right, it would, it's before it becomes a complete stop. So you have at least, at least, depending where we are in the tunnel and depending on the distance, again, if we're going to, from borough to borough, now we're going through a longer tunnel or over a bridge. Sure. So we're in between stops, so the tunnel will be much more problematic as a bridge, depending if you're close to a walkway or a gangplank, maybe you could get the people off. But again, there's only one conductor, one driver. The people can't just open these doors. It's like, we need somebody to come in. Oh, I'm not able to open this door if we're if we're stopped? No, you don't have the key to open the door okay. to get this done. So you would need the conductor to come in and do an emergency switch to, to get this door open. Okay. So that's where they would need to get from car to car. And that's so why there would be a large response time to get in here. It would be, right, depending where it is. Fire department has a pretty quick response time, but again, getting to the location, getting in, everybody down right. to the location. If it's in the station, much uh, obviously going to be quicker. Uh, once we got to get the firemen down to uh, into the tunnel or in between stations, uh, we're going to try to get them to respond to, to two stations and then try to attack from both ends. Then also inside a tunnel like this, if you did have to evacuate, you'd have other hazards like the electrified third rail, Yep. You've got other subway cars moving around, and really, it's not a good situation to be in. Right, and that's why we would, I would uh, again, it's a transit procedure at first, so I think the procedure try to get them to a, another car first, uh, get them out onto a platform in a safe area. Yeah, and I'd really love to see some testing done inside these cars to see what would happen and what that looks like. Uh, because without data, we really can't know what to recommend for, for like safety purposes. There, there might be some, there there's, there was some issues. We were trying to get that set up uh, yeah. with the MTA, but they wanted to do plausible deniability. There might be something coming uh, hopefully soon right. that will give us the data. Because one of the other issues we talk about the confined space is we, uh, we were at the Soteria Battery Consortium Group and the uh, detection application panel Absolutely. talked about the IDLH, the immediate danger to life and health, the term that we use in the fire service. 
is 10 to 20 times greater with a lithium ion battery for it. Sure. And in a subway, this is a confined space. Yeah. So you're talking the toxicity of the environment is 10 to 20 times greater, as well as the increase in carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide in lithium ion battery fires will incapacitate people much quicker than if it was an open space or it was not in a confined space. The other part of it is just the number of e-bikes that could be in any given car. And not only the number of e-bikes, but I've seen people in these subways where they take a bike lock, one of those U-shaped steel bars, and bolt their bike right to these bars. Right. So even if the bike does go off at a station, it's not like you can grab it and throw it out. So there's right. a lot of challenges around that as well. And something we do in, in fire services, we inspect exits to make sure that when people can get out safely. We inspect fire escapes, doorways that they're not locked. Uh, a bicycle itself, not even just an e-bike, but a bicycle e-bike is going to have a, it's going to block an exit somewhat. Yeah. So it's not safe as is, but just that adding that extra danger of fire hazard uh, with an e-bike or an e-scooter makes it uh, a little more dangerous. In eight cars, we have, you know, you don't have two exits in every car. The middle car is the conductor car, so really on those two middle cars, the fourth and eighth and fifth car, you're not able to get through in the middle where the conductor is, you would have to open those doors. So a, a real challenge if God forbid something happens here. We did have that one small fire yes. right before my op-ed was published in February, but when we looked at it, it looked like the, the scooter had a low state of charge. Yep. And that's why you didn't have the big volatile reaction that you had in some other videos you've seen. But that may not always be the case. I've seen a lot of people going to work uh, and then taking their e-bike, and I know they're a delivery person because they have a, a delivery bag, and then they have two batteries. They have the battery inside the bike, and they have battery taped or secured on the back of the rack as their second delivery battery. And I think that's a lot of people don't realize is why the number of incidents have happened here. You have a lot of delivery riders that are using e-bikes. About what is that number? Do you, do you have that off the top of your head? We've heard numbers of 60,000. I know Fly E-Bike talks about they sold 70,000 e-bikes and mopeds. Well, we think the number might be greater. Uh, we might be closer to about 100,000 delivery workers. But that number is a little skewed because you might have multiple delivery workers working on the multiple different delivery apps. Right. So it may not be as high as we think. Um, but when you're in the different parts of the city, you can see that there's a lot of people. And it's also the people that are using it for commuting. They may live in a transit desert and they're uh, just taking their e-bike or e-scooter uh, to get to the subway stop and then going into the city and then using it to get maybe to their work spot that aren't right. necessarily delivery service. You mentioned there's some other options for delivery workers. Yes, so there are some other options for delivery workers because again, they're low-income workers, they're people just trying to make a living. We're not trying to hurt them, but there is a ride share program called JOCO that is available to delivery workers that they have uh, bike stations and bike racks throughout the city and I believe in a couple locations in Queens where they don't have to take the bikes on the train, they don't have to take the bikes home, the batteries are charged and managed by the company. Uh, if they need to change out a new battery, they could just go to a, another rack, a bike rack and swap out a bike that has a charged battery in it. Um, so we're gonna go and take a look at that. Yeah, yeah, we'll hand out there and we'll look at it there. Okay, excellent. So this right here is Joco. This is a better option for a lot of the delivery services around the cities. I guess, tell me what you know about Joco and how that's beneficial for the city. Yeah, so I, I met Joco uh, first in like 2023 as we were starting to do our inspections around the city. And we learned from them that they were a option for delivery workers, that delivery workers didn't have to own their own personal bike. They were a ride share company that services delivery riders only. Uh, they sign up as a delivery rider and they have docking stations. And again, at the time that I first met them, maybe they had 30 docking stations and parking garages around the city. But it's a safer alternative for delivery riders because they don't have to take them on trains. They don't have to take them in their homes. So they can ride their bike two, three, four hours, whatever they get out of it. And then they could swap the bike for a new one uh, and they continue working for the rest of the day. So that I think is a great benefit to them. And it takes away that maintenance from the delivery worker, which can be costly as well. And it's also safer for everybody else. Right, and Joe Kill completely maintains the bikes. They maintain the batteries, very solid UL approved bike and battery that they, uh, they've got a good battery management system. They're always monitoring the data. So there's a lot of benefit to this. So if there is a problem with the battery, they know right away. The bike actually has telemetrics. It, it reaches out to them, lets them know, and they can pull it out. So that's definitely a benefit. And, uh, my understanding is today they haven't had any fires uh, in their bikes. Right. I don't know of any specific fires that they've had with the Joko bike or Joko battery. And again, they're expanding. 
but it, also by having that third party that monitors and maintains the bikes is going to say going to reduce the the possibility of fire it's going to reduce the mechanical electrical abuse because they're going to change things out or they're going to put their battery out of service right and again the other thing we like about it is it's a proprietary uh, bike with a proprietary battery with a proprietary charger so you're not getting that mix of of aftermarket batteries or chargers that delivery workers are using as well. Right, and if there's a fire here, it's a lot better than somebody's home because the fire is contained in this location. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's in an area that has uh, sprinklers, as you see, so it should be contained as well. It's, this one is uh, close, fairly close to the exit. Uh, again, still think better than being inside the home. But again, we're not trying to shut down business with delivery workers, we're not trying to hurt them but we know that there's too many bad actors out there yeah. selling low quality product that is susceptible to failure and fires. And that's why this is an option for yeah, them. It's just about getting a safer option for everybody. People aren't having fires in their home, quality products, and overall just making things safer in the city. Definitely thank you for coming out here, showing me around today, talking about the subway. I absolutely agree with you. I think e-bike should be banned on the subway system. Uh, right. There's an incredible hazard there. But no, thanks a lot. Patrick, thanks for coming out. Great seeing yeah. you again. And uh, let's go get an espresso. Absolutely. <laughs>